Hello, this is the League of Women Voters of the Austin area presenting Civics 201, Session 2, Understanding Your Government, the U.S. Congress. It is Saturday, March 6 at 11 a.m. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, we, I just wanted to point out that the bulk of the Contacting Your Representative content was created by Jennifer Delk, the LWV Austin Area Community Relations Director. And we just want to say thank you, Ms. Delk. So a uh, few things to note, the League of Women Voters is open to everyone. It is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government and influences public policy through education and advocacy. You can find more information at lwv.org. Um, a couple of the things that the League of Women Voters of the Austin area does uh, throughout the year is voter registration services, get out the vote activities, Vote, we produce the voters guide uh, for the Austin area and you can also find that at vote411.org. That's vote411.org. We also provide candidate forums, uh, high school voter education and registration programs, policy presentations and civic education programs such as this one. So let's jump right in and ask what is Congress? So the following information is provided by the U.S. Cap, uh, Capitol Visitor Center. Congress is the legislative branch of the federal government that represents the American people and makes nation, the nation's laws. It shares power with the executive branch, led by the president, and the judicial branch, whose highest body is the Supreme Court of the United States. Of the three branches of government, Congress is the only one elected directly by the people. As you may know, if you are watching this, uh, what I've read and what is presented on the slide are two, um, are, are just, the slide has bullet points as to what I've read. Um, so just to go over the bullet points again, the US Congress represents the people of the United States of America. They makes the nation's laws. They share power with the executive and judicial branches, and they are the only branch elected directly, directly by the people. So what is Congress continued? It's a bicameral legislative branch of government. It is comprised of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Both have equal but unique roles. Um, each has special constitutional duties and powers. So Congress is divided into two institutions, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The two houses of Congress have equal but unique roles in the federal government. While they share legislative responsibilities, each house also has special constitutional duties and powers. So to balance the interests of both the small and large states, the framers of the Constitution divided the power of Congress between these two houses. Every state has an equal voice in the Senate, while representation in the House of Representatives is based on the size of each population state or each state's population. And let's look at who can be a, rep a House representative. Uh, so someone who is running for House representative must be at least 25 years old. They must be, be seven, uh, have been a US citizen for the past seven years and an inhabitant of the state where they are chosen or elected. Uh, US House representatives are elected every two years and representatives are ap apportioned among the states. This is all um, under Article One of the Constitution, which discusses the function, focus, and requirements of the legislative branch of the US. Specifically, Section Two addresses the House of Representatives. House appor apportionment. The number of representatives for a state is determined by adding the whole number of free persons. Uh, so we need to remember that at the time of the writing of the Constitution, uh, the idea of persons in the United States that were counted towards whether it was census or voting uh, was widely different than it is today. And in fact, the determination of apportionment or allotment of representatives is described as follows. Representatives in direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to serve for a term of years, and excluding what is uh, referred to in the original text as Indians, not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. And in 
uh, the historically, the three-fifths of all other persons were referring to those who were enslaved. So furthermore, uh, in the 14th Amendment, Section 2, it stated that representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state. Of course, uh, the 14th Amendment came about after the Civil War. And so uh, it, although in this case, uh, they're still excluding what they uh, refer to as Indians that are not taxed. Um, so let's just be very clear that the native peoples of the United States are taxed. Um, and then furthermore, the Nationality Act of 1940 saw that all persons born on US soil, uh, including our native populations were deemed citizens. So um, just to continue, let's see. Uh, the number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000, but each state shall have at least one representative. So this is why the census is so important. The census count dictates how this number changes according to the number of people a state claims to have within it. Then Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution provides for both the minimum and maximum size of the House of Representatives. This is where, um, again, this is how it relates to not exceeding one for every 30,000 persons, uh, but for every state having at least one. And um, currently there are five delegates representing the District of Columbia, the Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marina Islands, or Mariana Islands. A resident commissioner represents Puerto, Puerto Rico. The delegates, delegates and resident commissioner possess the same powers as the other members of the House, except that they may not vote when the House is meeting as the House of Representatives. Some additional information about the House of Representatives. Uh, the executive authority issues the writs of election to fill any vacancies. They're, they choose their speaker and other officers. Uh, the House of Representatives also has the sole power of impeachment and all bills for raising revenue originate in the House of Representatives. Now we'll talk about who can be a senator. So a senator must be at least 30 years old. They must be a US citizen for at least the past nine years. Uh, they and have to be an inhabitant of the state in which they are chosen or elected. Senators are elected every two years, or sorry, six years. Uh, vice president, the vice president of the United States is the president of the Senate. The vice president has no vote unless the Senate is equally divided, um, which is also known as the tiebreaker vote. And uh, the senators shall be, uh, shall choose other office, officers and president pro tempore, which is Latin for uh, like a temporary president in absence of the vice president. So the sole powers of the Senate, the sole power uh, is to try all impeachments. The Chief Justice uh, presides over uh, those impeachments. So when sitting for that purpose, they shall be on, on an oath or affirmation. Uh, this is regarding the Senate. When the President of the United States is tried, uh, that is when the Chief Justice presides and no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two thirds of the members present, uh, which is uh, really important in this case. So the judgment for impeachment doesn't extend further any further than the removal of office, the disqualification to hold and enjoy any office, and uh, but the convicted party is liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment and punishment uh, as according to the law. The Senate also may propose or concur with amendments as on other bills. So what's the function of Congress? Uh, actually, there is quite a number of uh, bullet points on the function of Congress. And uh, while I can read to you directly from the article, uh, which is Article 1, Section 8 of the US Constitution, I actually would highly encourage you to um, find that information yourself. There's uh, resources that we will provide a uh, list of resources we will provide with this uh, webinar. So if you are in attendance, you'll be able to access that through the chat channel. If uh, you are not in attendance, you are, will certainly find a way to be able to post that list of resources for you. So the function of Congress, um, a few things, they collect taxes, 
duties, imposts, and excises. Those taxes, duties, imposts, and excises must be uniform throughout the United States. Or I should say the duties, imposts, and excises must be uniform throughout the United States. They uh, borrow money on credit for the United States, regulating commerce, establish uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies, coin money, uh, which is to mint money, regulate the value and of foreign coin. Uh, and they regulate the value of our currency and also of foreign coin. So provide punishment for counterfeiting US currency. They establish post offices and post roads. They promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their writings and discoveries, uh, otherwise known as patents and copyrights. So some more functions continued. They established the lower courts to the Supreme Court. Uh, so where the president appoints Supreme Court justices, uh, the Congress established those lower courts justices, uh, except for where they're voted. And so they also define punish pu and, and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of, the na or of nations, uh, which is maybe something that often people don't think of because this was also again written um, at the late end of the 1700s. So they, uh, Congress can declare war. Um, it also grants licenses to pass through the limits of a boundary of a country uh, for specifically for reprisal. Uh, they make rules concerning captures on land and water. Uh, Congress also can raise and support armies. In the original constitution text, it, says, it states along the lines that there's no appro appropriation of money to that use that shall be for a longer term than two years. Um, and there is has been amendments to that. And so um, again, Congress can provide and maintain a Navy, which kind of goes along the lines of raising and supporting armies, um, just a different branch. Uh, they make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. They provide for calling forth the militia, which is now known as the National Guard. Finally, uh, the function of Congress, they provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia or National Guard and for governing them. They reserve to the states the appointment of the officers and authority of training said militia or National Guard. Uh, they exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles or 10 square miles as may become the seat of the government of the United States. They exercise like authority over all places purchased for the erection of forts, magazines, articles, or I'm sorry, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. They make all laws, uh, and this one's kind of a really important clause. They make all laws necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or office or officer thereof. This is also known as the elastic clause, which we'll discuss in the next slide. And I just wanna point out in this particular slide, uh, not much was changed from the text in the constitution because so much of it is, is very kind of uh, specifically drawn and uh, it was truncated where necessary and, and um, kind of just posted as what might be the clearest form to understand. But again, you're certainly encouraged to look at the original text of the article and uh, section of the constitution that this is coming from, which is article one, um, section eight, I believe. So the elastic clause or the implied powers of Congress. They're alluded to in the last power of Congress in Article One, Section Eight. Uh, they're substantiated by Alexander Hamilton, um, who wrote the the uh, Hamilton's opinion as to the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States in 1791. So nowadays, that uh, opinion is understood as a sort of doctrine of implied powers for Congress. A uh, couple of the things to note about that doc or the uh, Hamilton's opinion was the right to employ all means requisite and fairly applicable to the attainment of the ends of such power, which is, you know, something he wrote directly in there. Um, he also wrote not precluded by restrictions and exceptions specified in the Constitution and or not immoral or not contrary to the essential ends of political society. So all this to say that Congress cannot without breach of trust 
lay taxes for any other purpose than the general welfare. Uh, and the cannot to welfare is all in quotes. It may be truly said of every government, as well as that of the United States, that is only it has only a right to pass such laws as are necessary and proper to accomplish, accomplish the objects entrusted to it. And that, again, is from Alexander Hamilton's writing of uh, opinion. Um, so what are the limits of Congress? Uh, so according to Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, the following is a list of those limits of Congress. Uh, the, I want to note that the bullets in italics on the PowerPoint are taken directly from Article 1, Section 9. Um, where possible, I'll go ahead and uh, give an audio, audio clue as to when those are italicized. Uh, when I, when I'm re as I'm reading out loud from the section, the descriptions in the slide are interpretations for, of the clauses found in Section 9. Um, if the interpretations in quotes made from the website are made from the website quote, Interactive Constitution, a website that is produced by Na the National Constitution Center. It's a scholarly, legal, and philosophical initiative. Uh, the descriptions marked with a star are very specifically found as tool tips when hovering over the section paragraph in the text menu. Um, so I'll start with uh, the first bullet point, which is starred, which is, means it's a tool tip in the text menu of the Interactive Constitution. And it states that it's an obsolete, uh, obsolete provision. Uh, the first limit is an obsolete provision. It's designed to protect the slave trade from congressional restriction for a period of time. Um, and again, obsolete because it has to do with the slave trade, um, which we no longer practice in the United States um, at, at, a, at a recognized governmental level. Uh, so limits of Congress for the second one. Uh, the clause provides that the federal government may not suspend this privilege except in extraordinary circumstances when a rebellion or invasion occurs and the public safety requires it. And this is a quote from the uh, interactive constitution. The, um, the information from the constitution itself is the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. So uh, provision three is uh, no bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed, which, which um, interpreted can be that no bill will be passed that leads to or retroactively leads to forfeiture of land and civil rights as a consequence of a sentence of death for treason or felony. And that's pretty vital in terms of kind of civil rights that uh, we have in the United States. So uh, the next clause is italicized, which means that I'm, what I'm reading from uh, the PowerPoint is directly from the Constitution. So no cap capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration herein before directed to be taken. Uh, that one's kind of a complicated one to interpret um, for me personally, and the interpretations that I found were more of a philosophical nature and questioning rather than a direct kind of a direct interpretation. Um, but the 16th Amendment replaced this clause in any case, granting power to tax to the to Congress without a proportionment uh, or apportionment and without regard to enumeration, uh, otherwise things like uh, enumeration, numer uh, numbering the peoples in like such as in the census. Um, and so for the last limit of Congress, this is italicized. So this is directly from the constitution. No tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. Uh, so to quote from uh, interactive constitution, it's despite this, the, or despite this title, the constitution permits three classes of taxation, direct, indirect, and income taxes on humans. A couple of more limitations, uh, no preference, and this is italicized, no preference shall be given by any regulation of commerce or revenue to the ports of one state over those of another, nor shall vessels bound to or from one state be obliged to enter, clear, or pay duties in another. In other words, it means that no taxes, taxes can be levied on any state for items exported or imported to another part of the, the union. Um, 
the next clause is on no money shall be drawn from the treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time. Um, in uh, the uh, interactive constitution, they describe that as quote, a requirement of legislative appro appropriation before public funds are spent. Um, also, a requirement states legislative duty to require an annual budget. Um, and then the next clause has to do with no title of nobility shall be granted by the United States and no person holding any office for profit or of profit, I'm sorry, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall without the consent of the Congress accept of any present emolument office or title of any kind whatsoever or whatever from any king, prince or foreign state. Um, so uh, the first part, the no title of nobility shall be granted by the United States is pretty set forward and established because we were just coming out of a rulership um, from the United uh, Kingdom or England. Um, and so the next part and all officers quote, uh, or including quote, American ambassadors stationed abroad are prohibited from accepting gifts from foreign governments and their officials. And that is inter interpretation from again, interactive constitution um, and then proceeds to prevent such diplomats from being bribed and corrupted by other foreign gifts and also to ensure that their loyalties remained undivided. Um, additionally, another limitation of Congress that maybe we don't think about too often as being as a limitation of Congress, but just kind of the way that uh, Congress, or the legislative branch and the executive branch uh, respond to each other is uh, how all bills are subject to veto by the president. But bills vetoed can be repassed by two thirds vote of sen the Senate and the House of Representatives. So how can we contact our representatives? Uh, this is some of the content that I mentioned earlier that was provided uh, by Miss Jennifer Delk, again, our League of Women Voters of the Austin Area um, Community Outreach or uh, Community Relations Director. So uh, here you'll notice that there is an arrow pointing to find your elected officials. This website is the League of Women Voters uh, website of Texas, and there's a specific um, tab called advocacy and issues in that tab you'll find who represents you um, in that website you'll find a link saying find your elected officials so you'll type in your address for example in this uh, example it's 1212 Guadalupe Street with the zip code 78701 and you'll get a, a array of pictures and descriptive information, uh, phone numbers and office uh, addresses uh, to be able to contact your representative from the president and the vice president uh, over to your senators and your US House representatives according of course, remember to your zip code. So um, in, this, um, in this example, the US representative that is uh, on screen is Representative Charles Eugene Roy or Chip Roy. Um, there's also information regarding the governor, Texas senators, Texas representatives, and the various other offices in the county and down to the city level. Um, so this resource is a very handy resource. Um, it will be included in the resource PDF, um, or I should say the link will. So again, how can we contact our representatives? There's the League of Women Voters of Texas resource, which is the Who Represents You link. Uh, there's also a directory of House representatives that one can use, and you can search uh, through house.gov uh, to find your representative according to area code, or I'm sorry, uh, zip code. Um, for district maps, committee, and subcommittee assignments and recent votes, you can go to clerk.house.gov um, backslash members backslash A00. 0371. Um, again, this is going to be included in the resource guide. Uh, for senators, you can go to the senate.gov site and index. Uh, there's a drop down menu at the very top left of that website that you can pull down and find your senators by state. Then uh, there's also GovTrack, which is a separate, um, not non governmental website that helps you track 
Congress members uh, information to be able to find their uh, contact information. And so another tip that a lot of folks maybe don't think of is to for finding the local congressional offices is to just go into Google Maps um, and type in US congressional district offices in and you can be really specific and say uh, your area code like 78701 um, district offices in a given city like Austin, Texas, or just go ahead and put in uh, in Texas and just see what what uh, offices come up. Um, you can zoom into a specific area if you're using the map function and then click the search in area button at the top of the map. So how do you get to know these people? Well, you can sign up for their office mailing list, follow them on social media, uh, find a trusted news source that you can, you know, listen to or read and be able to find what the different congressional peoples are doing. Revisit voters guides and candidate forums. It's always good to kind of go back and see where um, they stood about certain issues as they were campaigning and communicating with them, right? So how do I know which office to contact? Um, you can call 311 and ask the operator, or you can look online to find out, right? And so it's something that we were discussing. Uh, type who represents me in the search bar, um, but hopefully you'll be able to use these resources in our um, resource guide to be able to more directly find who represents you. So use your voice. Contacting your representative by phone, letter, or email is your opportunity to state your opinion and educate them on an issue. And it's a way for them to be aware that you as part of their constituency is looking at what they're doing and how they're doing it and where their votes are and you are paying attention. Um, so especially for those who um, repeat that they are representing their constituency, it's kind of a good way to keep track of whether or not they are representing your interests as well. So tips for contacting your representative. When you contact them, let them know who you are and what area you live in. Um, again, you can be hyper specific and say you live in a specific zip code or in a city, um, in a suburb of an area. And so that way they know more directly how what you're calling about relates to you. Um, you can discuss one topic and ask them to take a specific action. Um, of course, asking them does not necessarily mean or equate to them acting upon it, but at least in the asking, um, it's out there that this is something that is um, of interest to you and maybe to other members of your community if you're working in a leadership capacity. So keep your message short and simple um, and then thank them for their time. So a couple more ways to engage. Uh, here we have attending meetings and attending doesn't necessarily mean that you show up in person physically and you um, necessarily have any input during the meeting process. But a lot of the meetings that are uh, available right now are happening online, especially in our Congress. So if you can, and we have information later about how you can find House committee meetings um, or committee meetings and, um, and sessions and hearings that you can listen into, whether it's um, live or it's after the fact. Uh, you can provide testimony and testimony is also communicating and contacting your representative. Uh, supporting organizations who share your same interests and engage with your representatives. Um, and here at the League of Women Voters, we do have uh, action items that we send out to those who have signed up for receiving those action items. We'll talk about that in a little bit. If you have a minute or less, 15 seconds, send a tweet, blog, or forward an action alert to your network, uh, your community of people. If you have 30 seconds, enlighten a friend with your knowledge of an ish on an issue. I know this one kind of sounds like, um, you know, very uh, commonplace that, that this is this isn't actually doing and moving, but the more that we can educate those around us, the more impact we might be able to have on certain issues, um, because when we not, don't have more than a couple of seconds to be able to con contact our representatives, somebody else we know might, they might actually have much more time than we do, but if they don't know about an issue and they don't know uh, how to get involved, um, or at least know about the, the basics of an issue, they might not get involved and we might miss that opportunity. So enlightening a friend with your knowledge on an issue is always a good option. So if you have one minute, make a list of three action steps you can take in the future for that advocacy. 
If you have more than a minute to spare, uh, if you have three minutes, call your representative. Remember to identify yourself, describe the issue or the concern, ask them to take a specific action and say thank you. If you have five minutes, type an email to your elected official sharing an in-depth explanation of your stance on a certain issue or initiative. If you have a lot of time on your hands, uh, here it says to join a local board or commission. Um, you can also see about uh, just tuning into those house meetings uh, or to the meetings and hearings for Congress. Uh, be a part of that conversation in that way as uh, being a witness and listening. So, or join a watchdog organization that holds public offices accountable. More tips for contacting my representatives. Um, we have uh, an invaluable resource at the League of Women Voters uh, produced by the League of Women Voters of the Illinois Education Fund and the League of Women Voters of Wheaton. Um, it's a PDF entitled Making Your Voice Heard. And with, well, I'm just gonna go ahead and briefly put that up on the screen. Um, so this PDF has, it's just kind of a resource of all kinds of different things, but the page in question or the page that I want to highlight is page four of this eight page document, tips for communicating with your legislat le legislators. So again, some of the ba same basic principles apply, no matter what kind of government official that you're contacting, identify yourself, describe your issue, Refer to the exact bill number if possible. And there is a difference between Senate bills and House bills. So remember when you're contacting a representative about a certain bill, you wanna make sure that you are contacting the correct rep excuse me, representative for the bill that you are interested in um, discussing or the one that concerns you. Concerns you. Um, tell your legislator what action you would like to have taken mention any relevant credentials or background you have. You may or may not feel inclined to do so. Um, and if you don't feel inclined to do so, by all means, you have you don't have to participate in that way. So you definitely do wanna state your reasons uh, for contacting them. You wanna make sure it is uh, demonstrated in a way that is personal, that is affecting you. Um, anecdotes are often a really good way to communicate the things that we can't communicate in a more logical way. Uh, but you still want to stick to the facts, right? You want to make sure that what you're saying, it is personal, but it's true. Um, try not to stretch the truth and um, really kind of keep to the point and the focus of what you're trying to communicate to your representative. Try to limit your communication to one issue or bill. So if you're contacting them about a number of items, it make sure you each time that you want to contact them, it's about one item that you have in mind. Don't use one time contact to talk about five different issues um, because it's likely that the information that you're going to convey is going to get lost. Um, and it's, it's something to note that the offices of our representatives are uh, managed by staff members, um, often numerous. And so it might, it, it might not come across um, like uh, it might not be helpful to them to be able to uh, have multiple issues when you're calling, just make sure you're calling about one. Remember to be courteous and respectful. Again, these are other people who you are talking to on the other end of the phone. And while we understand that certain policies can um, bring about uh, certain feelings for us, it is definitely one of those things where uh, we would need, we would prefer to be treated a certain way and hopefully we would also um, be able to treat others respectfully. And uh, be open to listening to the office holders views um, because they may not hold that same interest that you do in particular about a certain item. Um, you might hold very similar interests in other areas um, but maybe just not the one that you're calling about. Don't be afraid to ask for a reply. Remember to be patient, but persistent. Send a thank you or a follow-up letter when that's appropriate. And know the rules. You should never promise a campaign contribution or give gifts to officials. Now, I know that that is something that a lot of people may feel um, is a double standard because there are other areas, especially in lobbyists, that maybe do do this kind of thing. Um, but hopefully as individuals, as a as citizenry, we would also recognize that um, 
we wouldn't want this to be um, a, a recurring thing. Um, of course, you are entitled to your opinion on this matter. Um, so furthermore, there are additional suggestions for phone calls and visits. Um, may, you can contact them at their home offices Mondays and Fridays during session. If they're not available, ask to speak to their legislative aide. Again, they do have a staff that is available for um, answering those phones, for getting co communications across to the representatives. Leave your name, address, and a message with that aide. Make an appointment or ask for a return call if you wish to have a direct discussion. Uh, that doesn't guarantee you will, but at least having that information out there, you might be able to, and, and in some cases, a lot of representatives do contact their constituents um, when, they, when they request for a direct discussion. So have your talking points ready and focus on the issue. Again, remember, not multiple issues, just one. Uh, cultivate cordial relationships with the staff. Um, and this actually goes a really long way in uh, getting that, that communication out there, getting that that uh, connection with your representatives. So again, this is a great um, resource. Uh, it's called Making Your Voice Heard. It's from the League of Women Voters of Illinois Education Fund and the League of Women Voters of Wheaton. Um, and this resource, is, res resource will be included in the resource uh, list. If you're looking for an action item to start with, uh, you have the LWV advocacy issues uh, take action. And there, that's actually some more information that we'll have in upcoming in a couple slides. So how do you find current session bills? Um, for Congress, you go to congress.gov. It lists dates of the last meeting and the next meeting, committee meeting information, including hearing and meeting video. Um, so this is where I was talking about um, if you're interested in a particular bill and you want to see how the committee is um, like looking into this bill, talking about it well before it hits the floor of the Senate or the House, um, then you would look at it, that hearing and meeting video. Actually, I believe this is exclusively for the House of Representatives. Um, so if you do happen to find one for the Senate, great. Um, then there's also Legiscan, legiscan.com uh, backslash US. They have a list of active US Congress bills, which is those that are introduced, engrossed, enrolled, and passed. They have a list of Congress sponsors um, and also the Congress committees. So that's a great resource. Again, if you can't seem to find it in one area, try to look for it in another website um, and see if you can find it there. It's always good to have more than one resource on this. Uh, finally, there's GovTrack, that's govtrack.us, and then you would go backslash Congress, backslash bills, um, then there's a list of coming up and trending bills, and you can sign up for alerts through GovTrack as well. So we're getting close to the end, um, and so there's going to be a list of a lot of sources and resources that um, have been used through this presentation. So I'm just going to go ahead and go through this slide and, and name the titles of the sources. The actual resource links will be included in um, the resource guide. If you are watching this, you, please feel free to pause and type out uh, these source links um, into another uh, browser. If you are listening to this, um, please do know that we do have a resource list. Um, and you'll be able to access that and just click through using that resource list. So the, resor the sources used for this presentation were the Constitution of the United States, uh, the, the 14th Amendment, uh, the Nationality Act of 1940, which is in reference to the indigenous or native peoples of the United States being counted towards a, pr a proportion, proportion. Uh, then the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is what the agency is called, they're frequently asked questions. Um, one thing about the uh, Native peoples not being taxed, uh, that's, it, it is such a frequently asked question that they added it to their frequently asked questions. So you can find that confirmation there. Uh, Hamilton's opinion as to the constitutionality of the Bank of the United States, which is actually provided through uh, Yale's law school. Uh, the Constitution Annotated, uh, which is another version of uh, kind of transcribing the Constitution, which is found at constitution.congress.gov. And finally, Interactive Constitution by the National Constitution Center.
and that's constitutioncenter.org, all Constitution Center, all one word, dot org backslash interactive dash constitution. So here are some recommendations to follow up because uh, this is just a huge amount of information on just the US Congress. Um, but if you're curious and you have the time and you would like to learn about it yourself um, or at least kind of find other resources that talk about the US Congress in more depth, um, for auditory learners, there are podcasts uh, such as Civics 101, um, which is also done in conjunction with NPR. And then there's an, an AP government podcast uh, done by a teacher with very short segments on uh, the different uh, things about US government, uh, such as Congress and the powers of the executive branch. Um, and so that you can find on Spotify. Uh, it's AP government. And for visual learners, there's a great uh, resource on YouTube in particular called Crash Course Government. Um, and so in the, the um, PowerPoint slide here, I've listed the bicameral Congress, uh, which is the second episode of the series on the US government. But there's also a link to the Crash Course series on US government as well. And for bill tracking, if you're an apps kind of person, there's Dome Watch, which is actually a really cool app. Um, I do want to note that it is, it is created from by the Office of Majority Leader uh, Steiny Hoyer. And so uh, for those who um, know the, the uh, League of Women Voters of the Austin area is nonpartisan, uh, but this is a resource and we look at it as a resource for connecting with, um, with your representative. So if you're looking to stay on top of issues of interest that you know dovetail or you would like to know if you dovetail with the League of Women Voters, uh, you can sign up to get action alerts at lwvtexas.org or text ACTION to 80123. So again, that's text ACTION at 80123. All right. Um, and we've reached the end of this presentation. Uh, if you would like to tune into previous civic sessions, you can catch them on our YouTube channel. Uh, so you can search League of Women Voters Austin area and that should bring up uh, on YouTube, that should bring up our YouTube channel. And then uh, there's a civics 101, 201 um, playlist. Uh, thank you so much and yeah, I uh, hope you have a great rest of your weekend.